Hi, kids. Today, we're going to read Chapter 7, Shadows in the Tall Trees of Lord of the Flies. Now, as a quick recap in Chapter 6, definitely things were getting very weird. Um, the kids were... Uh, the, the beastie really had come out. It specifically had appeared itself in front of the twins. The twins were panicking. Um, and Ralph and Jack decide to go off to the one part of the island where they think that it might be. Um, we are now going to get into chapter seven, once again called Shadows and Tall Trees. The pig run kept close to the jumble of rocks that lay down by the water on the other side, and Ralph was content to follow Jack along it. If you could shut your ears to slow suck down on the sea and boil the return if you forget how the dun and unvisited were the ferny coverts of the either side then there was a chance that you might put the beast out of mind and you could maybe dream for a while the sun had swung over the vertical and that afternoon heat was closing in on the island ralph passed a message towards to jack and when they came to the fruit the whole party stopped and ate Sitting, Ralph was aware of the heat for the first time that day. He pulled distastefully at his gray shirt and wondered whether he might undertake the adventure of watching it. Sitting under that seemed an unusual heat for this island. Ralph planned his toilet. He would like to have a pair of scissors and cut his hair. He flung the mask back, but his filthy hair right back to the half an inch. He would like to have a bath, too, a proper wallow with soap. He would like... He would pass his tongue experimentally over his teeth and decided that a toothbrush would also come in handy right about now. And then there were his nails. Ralph turned his hand over and examined them. They were bitten down to the quick, though he could not remember when he had restarted this habit, nor anything when any time when he indulged it. Gosh, I'm going to be sucking my thumb next, he thought. He looked around furtively. Apparently no one had heard. The hunters sat, stuffing themselves with easy, with easy meal, trying to convince themselves that they had got a sufficient kick out of the bananas and that the other olive gray jelly-like fruit. With the memory of this sometimes clean self as a standard, Ralph looked them over. They were dirty. Not with the spe spectacular dirt of boys who had fallen into mud or been brought down hard on a rainy day. Not one of them was an obvious subject for a shower. And yet, hair much too long, tangled here and there, knotted around a leaf, a dead leaf or a twig. Their faces were cleaned fairly well by the process of eating and sweating, but marked in and less accessible, angles with a kind of shadow. Clothes worn away, stiff like this, uh, his own with sweat, were put on, not for decorum or comfort, but out of custom. The skin of the body, scurfy with brine. He discovered with a full fall of the heart that these were the conditions he took as normal now, and he did not mind. He sighed and pushed away the stalk from which he had been stripped of fruit. Already the hunters were stealing away to do their businesses in the woods or down by the rocks. He turned and looked out to sea. Here on the other side of the island, the view was utterly different. The filmy enchantments of the mirage could not endure the cold ocean water, and the horizon was hard, clipped blue. Ralph wandered down to the rocks. Down here, almost on the level of the sea, you could follow your eye on the ceaseless, bulging passage of the deep sea waves. They were miles wide, apparently not beakers of the planked ridges of the shallow water. They traveled their length of the island with an air of disregarding it and being set on other business. They were less a progress than a momentous rise and fall of the whole ocean. Now that the sea would suck down, making c cascades and waterfalls of retreating water, they would sink past the rocks and plaster down the seaweed like shining hair. Then pausing, gather, and they would rise with a roar, irresistibly swelling over points and outcrop, climbing the little cliff, sending at last an arm of a surf up the gully to end a yard or so from him and fingers of spray. Wave after wave, and Ralph followed the rise and fall into something of that remoteness of the sea numbed his brain. And then gradually, the almost infinite size of the water forced itself on the attention. This was the divider, the barrier. And on the other side of the island, swathed with a midday 
with Mirage, defended by the shield of the Quiet Lagoon, one might dream of rescue. But here, faced by the brute of, of two sniffs of the ocean, the miles of division, one was clamped down, one was helpless, one was condemned, one was... Simon was speaking almost in his ear at this point. Ralph found that he had a rock painfully gripped in both hands. He found his body was arced, the muscles of his stiff neck, his mouth strained open. You'll get back to where you came from. Ralph nodded, or Simon nodded as he spoke. He was kneeling on one knee, looking down from a higher rock, which he held with both hands. His other leg stretched down to Ralph's level. Ralph was puzzled, and he searched Simon's face for a clue. It's so big, I mean. Simon nodded. All the same, you gotta get back, all right. I think so, anyway. Some of the strain had gone from Ralph's body. He glanced at the sea, and then he smiled bitterly at Simon. Do you got a ship in your pocket? Maybe we could use that. Simon grinned and shook his head. How do you know, then? When Simon was still silent, Ralph said curly, You're batty. Simon shook his head violently, till the coarse black hair flew backwards and forwards across his face. No, I'm not. I just think you'll be back all right again sooner than later than later. And for a moment, nothing more was said, and they suddenly smiled at each other. Roger called from the coverts. Come and see me! The ground was turned over near the pig run, and there were droppings in stream. Jack bent down to them as though he loved them. Ralph, we need meat, even if we are if we are hunting the other thing. If you mean going the right way, we'll hunt. They set off again. The hunters bunched a little by fear of the mentioned beast while Jack quested ahead. They went more slowly than Ralph had bargained for, yet in a way he was glad to loiter, cradling this spear. Jack came up against the emergency of his craft, and soon the process or the procession stopped. Ralph leaned against a tree, and at once the daydreams had come swarming up. Jack was in charge of the hunt, and there there would be a time to get to the mountain. Once, following his father with the Chapman to the uh, Devonport, they had lived in a cottage on the edge of the moors. In this succession of houses that Ralph had known, this one st stood out with a particular clarity, because after that, the house he had been um, sent away to was school. Mommy had still been with them, and Daddy had come home every day. Wild ponies came to the stone wall at the bottom of the garden, and it snowed. And just behind the cottage, there was a, shore, a sort of shed that you could lie up there, watching the flakes swirl past. You could see the damp spot where each flake died. Then you could mark the first flake that laid down without melting and watch the whole ground turn white. You could go indoors when you were cold and look out the windows past the bright copper kettle and the plate with the little blue men. When you went to bed, there was a bowl of corn flakes and sugar and cream. And the books! They stood on the shelf by the bed, leaning together with always two or three laid flat on top because he had not bothered to put them back properly. They were dog-eared and scratched. There was the bright, shining one about Topsy and Mossy that he never read because it was about two girls. And there was the one about the magician, too, which you read with a kind of tied-down terror. Skipping page 27 with the awful picture of the spider, there was a book about people who had dug things up. Egyptian things. There was the boy's book of trains, the boy's book of ships. Vividly, these memories all came back to him. He could have reached up and touched them. He could feel the weights and slow slide down with each of the mammoth book for boys that would come out and slither down. Everything was all right. Everything was good humored and everything was friendly. The bushes crashed ahead of them. Boys flung themselves wildly for the pig tracks and scrapped at the, creeping, cre at the creeper screaming. Ralph saw Jack nudge the side and fall. And then there were creatures bounding along the pig tracks towards him, with tusks gleaming and intimidating grunt. Ralph found he was able to measure the distance coldly and take aim. With the boar only five yards away, he flung the foolish wooden stick that he carried. He saw it hit the, ground, the great snout, and he hung there for a moment. The boar's notes changed to a squeal, and it swerved aside into the covert. The pig run filled with shouting again from the boys, and Jack came running back and poked through the undergrowth. Through here! But he do to us! 
but he'd do us. Through here, I said. The boar was floundering away from them, and they found another pig parallel to the first, and Jack raced away for it, too. Ralph was full of frights and apprehension and pride. I hit him! The spear struck him! Now they came unexpectedly to an open space by the sea. Jack cast about a bare rock and looked anxious. Ah, oh, man, he's gone! I hit him, though, Ralph said again, and the spear struck him a bit. He felt the need for a witness at this moment. Didn't you see me do it? Maurice nodded. Yeah, I saw you. Right bang on the snout. Wheeze! Ralph talked on excitedly. Yeah, I hit him all right. That spear stuck in. I wounded him, I think. He sunned himself in the new respect and felt hunting was good after all, maybe. Yeah, I walloped him properly. That was the beast, I think. Jack came back. Oh, that wasn't a beast. That was just a boar. Well, I hit him, whatever it was. Why didn't you grab him? I tried. Ralph's, vo Ralph's voice ran up. But a boar? Jack flushed suddenly. You said he'd do us. What did you want to throw for? Why didn't you wait? He held out his arm. Look. He turned his left forearm for them all to see, and on the outside was a rip. There was not much, but it was bloody. Yeah, he did that with his tusks. I couldn't get my spear down in time, and that's why I didn't finish him off. Suddenly now, the attention was all focused on Jack. That's a wound, and you ought to suck it like the, the Berengaria. At that moment, Jack started sucking his wound. I hit him, I, Ralph said indignantly. I hit him with my spear. I wounded him. He tried again to get all the attention away from Jack and back to himself. He was coming along the bath, and I threw like this. Ralph pretended to throw a spear. Robert snarled at him. Ralph entered into the play, and everybody laughed. Presently, they were all jabbing at Robert, who made mock rushes. Jack shouted, Make a ring! The circle moved in and around, and Robert squealed in mock terror and then in real pain. Ow, stop it! You're hurting! The butt end of the spear fell on his back as he blundered among them. Hold him! They got his arms and legs, and Ralph carried... And Ralph, who was carried away by a sudden thick excitement, grabbed Eric's spear, and he drabbed at Robert with it. Kill him! Kill him! And all at once, Robert was screaming and struggling with the strength of frenzy. Jack had him by the air and was brain brandishing his knife. Behind him was Roger, fighting to get close. The chant chose ritually at the last moment of the dance of the hunt. Kill the pig! Cut his throat! Kill the pig! Bash him in! Ralph, too, was fighting to get near, to get a handful of that brown, vulnerable flesh. The desire to squeeze and hurt was overmastering. Jack's arm came down, the heaving circle cheered, and made that pig and made that pig dying noises. And then they lay quiet, panting, and listening to Robert's frightened snivels. He wiped his face with a dirty arm and made an effort to retrieve his status. Oh, my bum! He rubbed his rump ruefully, and Jack rolled over. <laughs> that was a good game, guys. Yeah, just a game. I just got jolly badly hurt at Rugger once. Mm. We ought to have a drum, said Maurice. Then we can do it properly. Ralph looked at him. How properly? I don't know. You want to fire, I think, and a drum? And then you can keep time to the drum. Ah, oh, you want a pig said Roger, like a real hunt. Or well, something to pretend, said Jack. You could get something to dress up as a pig, and then he could act, you know. He could pretend to knock me over and all that, and then you guys could all attack him. Ah, oh, you want a real pig, said Robert, who was still caressing his rump, because you've got to kill him. You know what, let's use a little one, said Jack, and at that, everybody laughed. Ralph sat up. Well, we shan't find what we're looking for at this rate. And one by one, they stood up, twitching rags into place. And Ralph looked at Jack. Now we gotta go up that mountain. Shouldn't we go back for Piggy, said Maurice, before dark? The twins nodded like one of the boys. Yeah, that's right. Let's go up there in the morning. Ralph looked out and he saw the sea. We've got to start the fire again anyway. You haven't got Piggy's specs, said Jack. So you can't start the fire. Well, then we're going to have to find out if the mountain's clear, I guess, said Ralph. 
Reese spoke, hesitating, not wanting to seem a funk. Supposing the beast is up there, though. Jack brandished his spear. Then we'll kill it. The sun seemed a little cooler. He slashed with the spear. What are we waiting for? I suppose, said Ralph, if we keep on by the sea this way, we'll come out below the burnt bit, and then we can climb the mountain. Once more, Jack led them along the suck and heave of the blinding sea, and once more Ralph dreamed, letting his skillful feet deal with the difficulties of the path. Yet his feet seemed less skillful than before. For most of the way there, they were forced right down to the bare rock by the water that had to edge along between that and the dark luxuriance of the force. There were little cliffs to be scaled, some to be used as paths, lengthy traverses where one used hands as well as feet. Here and there, they could clamber over wave-wet rock, leaping across clear pools and the tide had left. They came to a gully, and they split the narrow foreshore like a defense. This seemed to have no bottom, and they peered awestruck into the gloomy crack where water gurgled. Then the wave came back. The gully bowled over before them, and spray dashed up from the very creeper, so that the boys were wet and shrieking. They tried the force, but it was thick and woven like a bird's nest. And in the end, they had to jump one by one, waiting till the water sank. And even so, one of them got a second drenching. And after that, the rocks seemed to be growing impassable. So they just sat for a time, letting their rags dry and watching the clipped outlines of the rollers that moved so slowly past the island. They found fruit in the haunts of bright little birds that hovered like insects. And then Ralph said that they were going too slowly. He himself climbed a tree that parted the canopy and saw the square head of the mountain seeming still a great way off. Then they hurried along the rocks and Robert cut his knee quite badly and they had to recognize that this path must be taken slowly if they were going to be safe. And so they proceeded after that as if they were climbing a dangerous mountain and the rocks became an uncompromising cliff overhung with the impossible jungle and falling sheer into the sea. And Ralph looked at the sun critically. Early evening, after tea time at any rate. I don't remember this cliff, said Jack, crestfallen. So this must be a bit of the coast I missed. Ralph nodded at that. Let me think. By now, Ralph had no self-consciousness in public thinking, but he would treat the day's decisions as though he were playing chess. The only trouble was that he would never be very good at playing chess. He thought of the little ones and Piggy, and vividly he imagined Piggy by himself, huddled in a shelter that was silent except for the sounds of a nightmare. We can't leave the little ones alone with Piggy, not all night, said Ralph. The other boys said nothing but stood around watching him. If we went back, it would take hours. Jack cleared his throat and he spoke in a queer, tight voice. We mustn't let anything happen to Piggy, must we? Jack ta Ralph tapped his teeth with the dirty point of Eric's spear. Well, if we go across... He glanced around him. Someone's got to go across the island and tell Piggy that we'll be back after dark. Bill spoke, unbelieving. You mean I got to go through the forest by myself? That's what you're saying now? Well, we can't spare more than one person to go. That's the problem. Simon pushed his way to Ralph's elbow. I'll go. I mean, I don't mind. Honestly, I'll go. Before Ralph had time to reply, he smiled quickly, turned, and he climbed into the forest. Simon was off. Ralph looked at Jack, seeing him infuriatingly, infuriatingly for the first time. Jack, the t that one time you went the whole way to the Castle Rock. Jack lowered. Yeah? You came along this part of shore, below the mountains, beyond there, is that right? Yeah. And then... Well, then I found a pig run, and it went for miles. Ralph nodded. He pointed at the force. Everybody agreed sagely. Well, all right, then. We'll smash away through all this till we find the pig run. He took a step, and he halted. Wait a minute, though. What does that pig run go to? The mountain, said Jack. I told you. Don't you want to go to the mountain? Ralph sighed, sensing the rising antagonism, understanding this was how Jack felt as soon as he ceased to lead. I was thinking of the light. We'll be stumbling about. Well, we were going to go look for the beast, weren't we? Yeah, but there's not going to be enough light for it now. I don't mind going. I'll go when we get there. Won't you? 
And would you rather go back to the shelters and tell Piggy, or would you rather do that? We can get Simon if you want, and we can tell him to stop. And now it was Ralph's turn to flush, but he spoke despairingly out of a new understanding that Piggy had given him. Why do you hate me? The boy stirred uneasily, as though something indecent had just been said. The silence had lengthened. Ralph did not hurt, and he turned away first. Come on, man. He led the way, and he set himself as by right to hack in the tangles. Jack brought up the rear, displaced and brooding. The pig track was a dark tunnel, for the sun was sliding quickly towards the edge of the world, and in the forest, shadows were never far to seek. The track was broad and beaten, and they ran along a swift trot. Then the roof of the leaves broke up, and they halted, breathing quickly, looking at the few stars that pricked around the head of the mountain. There you are. The boys peered at each other doubtfully. Ralph made a decision. We're going to go straight across the platform and climb tomorrow. They murmured in agreement, but Jack was standing by his shoulders. I mean, if you're a friend, of course. Ralph turned on him. Who went first to the castle rock here? Well, I went too, didn't I? And that was daylight. This is night. All right, well, who wants to climb the mountain now? Silence was the only answer they got. So, Nick, what about you? Um, well, I think we ought to go and tell Piggy. Yes, Piggy, we got to tell Piggy what? Wait a minute, Simon already went to tell Piggy. Yeah, but we got to, we should all go tell Piggy, you know, just in case. Maybe we shouldn't go right now. Let's go tell Piggy. Robert, Bill, what do you think? They were straight back to the platform now. Not, of course, that they were afraid, but they were tired at this point. Ralph turned to Jack. You see, we can't go now. Well, I'm going up that mountain. The words came from Jack viciously, as though they were a curse. He looked at Ralph, his thin body tense, his spear held in a threat in him. I'm going up that mountain to look for the beast. And then the supreme sting, the casual bit of word. Are you coming? At that, the other boys forgot their urge to be gone and turned back to sample his fresh rub of two spirits in the dark. The word was too good, too bitter, too successfully daunting to be repeated. It took Ralph... A low water. It took Ralph at low water when his nerve was relaxed for the return of the shelter and still friendly waters of the lagoon. Yeah, I guess I don't mind. Astonished, she heard his voice come out, cool and casual, so that the bitterness of Jack's taunt felt powerless. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, of course I'll go, Ralph said. Oh, not at all. Jack took on a step at this point. Well then? Let's go. Side by side, they watched by silent boys. The two started up the mountain, and Ralph stopped. We're silly. Why are we the only two to go? If we find anything, two's not going to be enough. There came the sound of boys scuttling away. Astonishingly, a dark figure moved against the tide. Roger? Yes. That's three, then. We got at least one more. Once again, they set out to climb the slope of the mountain. The darkness seemed to flow around them like a tide. Jack, who had said nothing, began to choke and cough, and a gust of wind set all the three sputtering. Ralph's eyes were blinded with tears. Ashes! We're on the edge of a burnt patch or something! Their footsteps on the occasional breeze were stirring up a small devils of dust. Now, when they stopped again, Ralph had time while he coughed to remember how silly they were. If there was no beast, and almost certainly there was no beast, in that case, well, good and well and good, but if there was something waiting on top of the mountain, hmm, what was it that any of the three of them, handicapped by darkness and carrying only sticks, what could any of them do against a beastie? We're being fools. Out of the darkness came the answer. Windy? Irritably, Ralph shook himself. This was all Jack's fault. He did this to them. Of course I'm windy, but we're still all being fools. If you don't want to go on, said the voice sarcastically, I'll go up by myself, Jack said. Ralph heard the mockery, and at that moment he hated Jack. The sting of ashes in his eyes, tiredness, fear, it all enraged him. Go on then, we'll wait here. There was a silence. Why don't you go? Are you frightened, Jack? A stain in the darkness, a stain that was Jack, detached itself and began to draw away. All right, then. So long. I'll go. 
Ralph felt his knees against something hard and rocked a charred trunk that was edgy to the touch. He felt the sharp cinders that had been bark push against the back of the tree and knew that Roger had sat down. He felt with his hands and lowered himself beside Roger while the trunk rocked among invisible ashes. Roger, uncommunicative by nature, said nothing. He offered no opinion on the beast, nor told Ralph why he had chosen to come on this mad expedition. He simply sat and rocked the trunk gently. Ralph noticed a rapid and infuriating tapping noise and realized that Roger was banging his silly wooden stick against something. And so they sat, rocking, tapping, impervious, Roger and Ralph, fuming around close the close sky that was loaded in stars, save where the mountains punched up a hole of the blackness. There was a slithering noise high above them, the sound of someone taking giant and dangerous strides on the rock. And then Jack found them and was shivering and coking in a voice that they could only just recognize as his. I, I saw a thing on the top! They heard him blunder around the trunk, which rocked violently. He lay silently for a moment, and then he muttered, Keep a good lookout, and maybe following up. A shower of ash pattered around them, and Jack sat up. I saw something bulge on that mountain. Ah, you only imagine it, because nothing's going to bulge, not any kind of creature at least. Roger spoke, and they jumped, for they had forgotten that Roger was even there. A frog? Jack giggled and shuddered. Some frog, there was noise too, a kind of plop noise. Then the thing balls. Ralph surprised himself, not so much by the quality of his voice, which was even, but by the bravado and in his intention. Well, we're going to have to go and look. For the first time since he had first known Jack, Ralph could feel him hesitate. Wait, now we're going to go look? His voice spoke for him. Well, of course we are. He got off the trunk and he led the way through the clinking cinders of the dark and the others followed. Now his physical voice was silent, and the inner voice of reason, and the other voice, too, made themselves heard. Piggy was calling for him a kid. Other voices told him not to be a fool, and the darkness of desperate enterprise gave him the night a kind of dentist chair on reality. And as they came to the last slope, Jack and Roger drew near, changing from the ink stains of indistinguishable figures. By common consent, they stopped and crouched together. Behind them on the horizon was a patch of lighter sky where in a moment the moon would rise. The wind roared once in the forest and pushed the rags against them. Ralph stirred. Come on now, let's go. They crept forward. Roger was lagging a little. Jack and Ralph turned the shoulder for the mountain together. The glittering lengths of the lagoon lay below them and beyond oh, that a long white smudge that was the reef. And Roger joined them. Jack whispered, Let's creep forward on hands and knees. Maybe the beast will be asleep. Roger and Ralph moved on, this time leaving Jack in the rear for all his brave words. They came to the flat top where the rock was hard to hands and knees, and there was supposedly a creature that bulged. Ralph put his hand in the cold, soft acid of the fire, and he smothered a cry. His hand and shoulders were twitching from the unlooked for contact. Green lights of nausea appeared for a moment and ate in the darkness. Roger lay behind them and Jack's mouth was at his ear. Over there, there that's where there used to be a gap in the rock. There's sort of a hump, do you see? Ashes blew into Ralph's face from the dead fire. He could not see the gap or anything else because the green lights were opening again and growing and the top of the mountain was sliding sideways. And once more... From a distance, he heard Jack whisper, Are you scared? He was not scared so much, but paralyzed. Hung up there in an immovable on the top of a diminishing moving mountain, Jack slid away from him. Roger bumped, fumbled with a hiss of breath, and he passed onwards. He heard them whispering, Can you see anything? There, look! In front of them, only three or four yards away, was a rock-like hump, but there was where no rock should be. Ralph could hear a tiny chattering voice coming from somewhere, perhaps from his own mouth. He bound himself together with his will. He fused his fear and loathing into hatred, and he stood up. He took two lead and stepped forward. Behind them, the silver of the motion, the silver of the moon had drawn clear the horizon, and before them, something like a great ape was sitting asleep with its head between its knees. And then the wind roared in the forest, and there was confusion in the darkness, and the creature lifted its head holding together them the ruin of a face. 
Ralph found himself taking giant strides among the ashes. He heard other creatures crying out and leaping and dared the impossible on the dark slope. Presently, the mountain was deserted, save for those three abandoned sticks and the thing that bowed before them. Guys, things are getting intense here. All right. Definitely still this power struggle is going on. It's definitely, I think, funny that in one couple pages even, we see both Jack and Ralph kind of being cowardly. And almost when the one's acting a little afraid, that suddenly brings up courage in the other one. It's like they need to prove, well, look, I'm not a coward like this guy is. Um, definitely seems to be here that there's some type of beast or something here in this cave. Um, that's all for now. Uh, we are going to be doing a little bit more reading this week, so stay tuned, guys. And uh, we will be doing the next couple chapters in the next couple of days. So take care, everybody.